Hey, okay, I, uh, it's actually, it's same day, I'm back, um, basically I kind of got interrupted a little bit and had to, uh, walk away, so, uh, this isn't really session two, even though it'll end up get, getting uploaded as a separate video, this is session, <coughs> I'll call it 1.5. So, when we, uh, last left off in our last session there, Eggle was, uh, just departed, leaving the new captain in charge. Actually, I'm going to do this. One sec. So. Oh. Uh, Xanathar's Guide is much better than that fantasy name generator site for generating names. So let's see. Uh, just because it's possible these characters could come up again at some point. <clears throat> it's entirely possible. Uh, let's give, uh, um, the crew knew that Eggle wasn't, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the crew knew that Eggle wasn't exactly the captain's biggest fan. He didn't help with the mutiny, but he didn't hinder it either, and he certainly didn't take the captain's side. So when all was said and done, the new captain, who we're going to find out, uh, who this is here, what their name is, uh, is, uh, yeah, the new captain's going to kind of give him a rowboat to row in, row into Port Sirik. That's kind of the, how he's going to arrive in Port Sirik. Uh, so to begin with, uh, we're back into our mythic fate charts here. So, um, is the new captain, um, uh, human? I'm going to call it very likely, which gives us a 75% chance. That's a 94. They are not human. Oh, sorry, it's a 49. Yes, they are human. Okay, new captain. And new captain, we got a human. What do we got here? Let's give them a... Uh, okay, so next, let's go... Are they male? This is going to be 50-50. Also female. All right. Um... So I'm gonna roll on. So there's all. If you ever, if you have a copy of Xanathar's Guide, uh, I mean, when I was running D and D Fifth Edition, I used maybe a little bit out of this thing. It's okay. It's got some good stuff. It's got some a lot of stuff that just kind of. I was never big on just adding stuff for the sake of adding stuff to uh, to D and D. But I mean, again, I played A D and D Second Edition back in the '90s for a long time, and. Uh, by the time I gave up on second edition, I would I would come to game nights with a stack of books like this. Now, thankfully, they were held you know at my place, which when I was a teenager, of course, I was still in my parents' house, so I just had this huge stack of D and D core books, monster manuals, splat books, campaign settings, you name it, and I would just bring like. Unless there was something that we definitely weren't using, you know, like the Dark Sun, if we weren't playing Dark Sun or whatever, or Spelljammer and stuff. I, I would leave that maybe in my room. But then I would be like walking down the stairs, you know, to our living room, which is usually where I, I ran our games when I was a teen. <laughs> With this huge stack of books, the complete guides to every fucking thing on the planet. With apologies here, I just realized I need to uh, do this. Uh, guide to everything on the planet, right? Like... That would be my, that 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 would be my game session. Uh, such there, I would bring everything. And we used every rule. We had all, you know, we had all the classes and the. We used all the kits at one point or another. I remember one game uh, that I was running. The guys did nothing but make up bards and use different kits from the AD and D uh, complete bar uh, complete bard handbook. That was it. Sean, Tim, I think my buddy Steve was uh, was playing uh, with us at that point. I'm pretty sure he was. And all they did was make up a, a group of bards. And that was it. Again, AD&D 2nd edition rules, right? So, anyway. So, um, I don't like too many optional rules. I don't like a lot of expanded stuff. So, uh, I'll have a little bit. But I really love kind of like the D&D 5th edition thing. Where you, at least at first, and most of the time it's been out... 
the core book is what you need. There's a few other things, but they you at least until the last couple of years, whatever, they didn't start getting crazy with the, all their editions. Anyway, so but one thing I do like here is that they have these random name tables. So I'm just going to go with the first one here for humans, which is the Arabic uh, names. She is female. 66. Christina. Uh, <laughs> new captain. Yes. Captain Christina. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Captain Kistina, yeah, um, we're going with that. So yeah, uh, once again, we got female, human, ships, captain, call, throw min mutineer while we're at it. And let's actually just find out a little, little bit about Captain Kistina. My apologies if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, of course, but uh, I, I, I not going to go looking up uh, proper pronunciations for everything right now. But, so we're going to switch over to Oon again. I'm going to throw myself back into this window. Oon. Um, I'm going to try to figure out what role possibly she played on the ship before too here. So I'm going to just pop back here. NPC modifiers. Uh, start with the first NPC modifier and we've got a 2. Addicted. Okay, that's not good. Um, and the n noun. 70. Clairvoyant. Well, that's interesting. I'm thinking... I'm thinking... With a clairvoyant kind of thing, I'm thinking also a magic user. Uh, maybe not the most skilled of magic users, but to get clairvoyance, I think you need a couple of levels. Um, I have not looked at spells at all since I started uh, taking a look at my my uh, basic expert stuff. But I kind of like that um, motivations. Let's let's do it. Uh, so her motive that was motivation. Actually, I'm just going to do this because I want to make sure that's clear. This is a NPC thing. Um, motivations. Cool. Let, let's let's find out here. We're gonna roll. We'll start with the verb. Fifty-eight. Produce. And the noun. All this is in Dune, of course. Forty-five. Pain. Produce pain. Ooh. Ah. Uh, Captain Christina, possibly not the nicest of people, um, but produce pain. I'm thinking. Um, uh, I'm thinking her target is uh, is is Mad Eye Hayes, the former captain of the Prancing Unicorn. Um, I think uh, I think the former captain might be in for a world of hurt. But we're not really too worried about uh, the, the former captain or the now current current captain. Um, we're going to be worried about what's coming afterwards. Now I want to help check something because I realize I probably screwed a couple things up. I don't remember what that 66 was for. Was that name stuff? It might have been. I'm forgetting. Oh no, actually, it doesn't matter. 66 is doubles, but it was still above. Even if it was on a fate chart, it was still above the chaos factor. So there's no random event that would be generated uh, if I'm remembering to do that right. Um, so Captain Christina, you know, fi finally, uh, um, Eagle climbs himself down. So, ah, uh, I don't suppose you'd do me a favor and not stab me. And uh, the new captain um, looks up. I'm thinking she was probably the quartermaster. We're going to go with that. Um, she took her chance here. She, she, ended up in, in, she ended up in power in a new role. And she looks up and she says, As long as that sword stays in its scabbard, we'll have no problems, Egil. And Egil kind of 
nods and only he can only hope that by crawling down hand over hand you know again legs wrapped around the the rope you know again one of those angled ropes that kind of connects the mast down to the uh, uh, to, to the to the main ship's deck there and they'll often use to go up to a crow's nest or, or to check on the sails or do whatever I don't know I do not know enough about sailing so he finishes crawling down and there's you know the, the new captain she's put on she's put on the red hat of uh, of Captain Mad Eye and she looks at him she's like well I do appreciate your um decision to stay out of the fight this we, uh, we're not exactly allies, but, uh, you certainly did not hinder our attempt to take the ship. You know the crimes that have been committed against our, our crew by the former captain. And, uh, Eggle, I'm still trying to get, I'm going to try to get Eggle's voice here, and he says, Yes, I do understand. Uh, I'm no fan of Captain, uh, former Captain Mad-Eye, but, uh, there is still the... There's still the, the topic of discussion regarding about Port Syrik. It's like, I'm afraid, uh, I see that the captain still lives, and, uh, I do believe that unless you're planning on throwing her overboard now, you could very well be tried and hanged as mutineers, uh, once we get into the port. And, uh, Christina kind of nods solemnly, finger to her puts puts a finger to her lips and the you know the, her hand on her chin and she says you are correct men ladies I think it's time we put Port Syrik in our well <laughs> in our stern Port Stern bow no oh, I've got that wrong so the back of the ship <laughs> into the back of our ship I should look that up. Not that it matters. We're about to be off a ship. And he goes, well, I was hoping to uh, not have to swim. Is there any way you can get me a little closer? He says, Eggel, I'm pretty sure there's a rowboat we no longer need. It's all yours. Eggel gives a quick you know, kind of a nod and a half salute to, with his hands. And he says, Perhaps you, perhaps we will meet again one day, Captain. She says, possibly so, but definitely not in Port Syrik. The rowboat's that away. Okay. And Eggle goes over and, you know, with a little bit of help from the, the crew, he kind of takes one last glance and notices that the captain and her loyalists are, the <clears throat> former captain and her loyalists are tied up and, you know, kind of tied to, uh, tied to the base of the, the, the midship mast. She just glares daggers at him and he just kind of gives a little two-fingered salute and wondering if this is the last time he'll see of the Prancing Unicorn and its crew and uh, the former captain. But either way, he has, a, he has a boat to start rowing. So the crew help him into the into the ship into the ship into the into the rowboat and uh once he's kind of settled in and holding on to the oars he just uh, he just kind of takes one more look and you know, good luck captain and the crew kind of take an axe and chop 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 and they cut the rope that's holding the rowboat uh in place and it Drops and you know Eggle kind of gets the you know stomach uh, coming coming up into his throat, feeling for a second, and then he just it's a sudden stop as he hits the water, and the 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 water of the the ocean splashes on him a little bit, and there's a cheer from up above and waving arms and you know well, almost like a cruise ship, yay! <coughs> and he, as the sh ship continues to turn around to leave. Uh, to leave Port Syrik behind, Eggle begins to uh, put his back into it and starts to row towards shore, turning himself kind of around so he's facing out to sea. Every once in a while, taking a look over his shoulder, and he makes his way into uh, 
into Port Sirik. Uh, how far is he? How long does it take him? Uh, does it take him about two hours? We'll just call it a 50-50. 93. Is a no, it doesn't take him two hours. It ends up taking him a little bit longer. We're going to call it three hours to row in. Um... making my notes um yeah so there we go so he finally he's kind of getting and the he you know after, after stuff his arms are getting his other arms are tired uh eggle is reasonably strong he's above average but not significantly even so you know it's a lot it's a lot of motion it's a lot of rowing and, you know, the wind picks up and now it's, you know, it's kind of getting, the sun is starting to set on, uh, on Port Sirik as he pulls up into the docks, you know, and kind of gets the last row. And actually he aims a little, he aims a little over to the side side. He goes into the, goes, goes into the sand there, you know, and he, he starts to kind of feel the, the oars, you know, the bottom of the, the, the oars start to kind of hit solid he's got to make you know shallower and shallower rows and finally whew, he feels the boat kind of like snug right up onto a, the sandbank and he looks out and yeah he he lets go of the oars stretches his arms a little bit oh, and then picks himself up and hops over the side into the water his boots splashing down and he grabs onto kind of the the, the, the front of the rowboat and he pulls it a bit up further up on shore hauls the thing as hard as he can uh, so that it's about half or so out of water and so that it doesn't you know get caught up in the tides and, and float back out to uh, float back out to sea and uh, is there someone that sees him I'm gonna say that's very likely five is not a um it's not an exceptional yes but it is a yes someone sees him okay uh who do we have that sees him um is it a fisherman i'm gonna say likely uh, we got a 71 that's a no it's not a fisherman so i'm gonna say it's more like a uh a longshoreman kind of a worker right uh, oops and uh, again he kind of stops let's go and he go you know let's go to the rowboat for a sec and he quickly kind of goes and checks on the oars and he unlatches them takes them out of the the, uh, the little socket areas of what i don't know what they call them and he puts them in the rowboat and he picks up his backpack and sh shoulders it it's uh i think it's relatively full fairly heavy because uh, when we got down to inventory so his backpack can hold 400 cn. I forget what cn means, but it's basically but basically 400 units of space. It's not full. It's about you know it's definitely more than half, uh, but not quite uh, three quarters. Like what's that? It doesn't matter. My math is going to be terrible. But you know, so what we have here. Um, we got a bunch of different things. There's he's also got a, a large sack which is filled actually with his food. So I like the way this is kind of set up. So I can look at everything at one go here, or I can look at them individually. To look at everything at one go, we can kind of go. So here, here's what he's wearing. He's got a backpack on. He's wearing leather armor. He's got a sword and a dagger on his belt. He is carrying a large sack. And also kind of being worn is a backpack. In the backpack, he's uh, he's got a grappling hook. He's got a length of rope. He's got a bunch of torches. 
His thieves tools are buried in the bottom of the backpack, so it's not to be easily found. Uh, he's got a water skin, uh, which is probably a little low on water, uh, and a tinder box for, for lighting those torches or anything else. So, uh, belt pouch is there, and I'm not worried about that. So, inside the sack, he's got seven days of, of standard rations. Uh, and that's pretty much all that, all that he owns. Uh, plus, as well, he's got 41 gold coins. And apparently now he also has a rowboat. <laughs> um, but we'll come back to the rowboat in a second here. From over his sh shoulder as he's putting the oars away, he hears, Aye, lad, something happened to your ship. And he turns back. I did. It uh, went back out to sea. They had some uh, employment problems. Ah, a mutineer, are you? Not me, just a passenger. I, I, mate, understand. Here you'll find Port Sirik. Welcome to the port. Uh, Thank you. Up that way you will find shops, a place to sleep, the local taverns of course, and uh, work. If you are looking for work on boats, on ships, or around the docks, you will find much work. I appreciate that. And now he turns so that the, the longshoreman guy actually gets a look at uh, the sword and uh, the, the longshoreman's eyes go, why is it? Or perhaps you're looking for something more adventurous. Could be. Could that I be? Ah, for that you'll also want to check the taverns, my new friend. For there you will find shady individuals that hang out looking for adventurers such as yourselves. Because uh, that's what happens. People, shady people hang out in taverns. Uh, you know, Inns and taverns in D and D, looking to you know, looking for adventurers to hire for work. This is so. Again, Eagle stretches a little bit once more. Kicks some of the water from his boots. They're uh, he's get got all his boots are a little squishy. And he uh, says, "I thank you, I thank you, new friend. I." Uh, do believe I shall check out the, the town itself. How big is this town? Uh, and he basically gets a very brief kind of description about uh, Port Sirik. Uh, at the very least, you know, he gets kind of the, the basics of, you know, the population. That it's a human settlement, it's a trade town. Um, and of course, I'm sure the, the, the longshoreman tells him all about the fassa fruits, how sweet they are, that they're worth eating. Uh, which sounds actually pretty good to, uh, to our hero, Engel, at the moment, seeing as he's been eating nothing but rations and fish, and probably a lot of dried fish, you know, s smoked herring or something like that on the, for, for the last, you know, few weeks. Um, I bid you adieu, my, my new friend, who I don't know your name and don't really care about. And he sets off uh, onto the docks themselves. He plants his feet crunk, on the wooden docks, realizes that the, some of the boards are a little a little worn, but he looks around and Port Syriac actually is a fairly colorful town. Uh, the, the buildings at the docks aren't just kind of, you know, wood, but they're painted uh, bright, bright colors. Some of which, are, again, are a little worn, but feeling, feeling all right. You know, like they, they look kind of decent, you know, they're not... Uh, even though the the sun is setting on on Port Syric, the uh, it feels kind of bright and a, 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 a nice change of pace from the the northern reaches and its cold <laughs> cold hard way of life. I don't really know anything about the northern reaches, and I'm not going to worry too much about it yet. Uh, let's see here. So he's sets foot on the docks and can, starts walking uh, walking his boots kind of squishing as they clomp clomp on the 
uh, on the wooden boards that make up the docks and he makes his way into the the streets now it's a poor street so it's probably kind of like just dirt dirt roads and he looks around for it for a tavern he's in the docks yes he's going to find a tavern um, do we have let's see if Xanathar's guide has anything for like randomizing a tavern and nope doesn't look like it um, I don't know if I've got anything good for for generating tavern names at the moment let's uh let's see do I have anything Let's see here. Scarlet Heroes, maybe. No, I don't think it really has much that was all that useful for this kind of thing. Got all kinds of other stuff, but. But I had. generator here we go towns we've already kind of found out a little bit of this we don't need a name we need uh, I don't think there's actually anything here for a uh, random generator for a uh, Nope, I'm gonna say no, there's not. I probably need something to help with this. Uh, let's see here. Can we go back to our names here? Let's see if we can, we've gotta be tavern names. Let's see if this is helpful. Tavern names, really the National Guinea Pig Tavern. <sighs> okay. Gonna look to see if any of these are kind of useful. <laughs> the gentle sharks, Jesus. Um, the Lean Rose Inn. That's what we're going to call it. Uh, Docks, uh, Eggle finds the Lean Rose Inn. Um, possibly named after a rose, or named after a rose herself or something? We don't know. And he slips inside to uh, take a look around. Is it busy? Uh, it's nearing evening, so I'm thinking there's a like. it's probably likely that it's uh, somewhat busy. Just got two binders going a different solo and RPG utilities and books and tables and whatever that all stuff that I've printed so I just kind of flipping back and forth so likely likely that it's busy uh, things in the way 71 um, no it's not um, the lean rose in now I'm pretty sure Pretty sure there's descriptors for tavern. See, it's so one thing about Mythic here. That's what I guess. The one thing about Mythic is that it's got lots of meaning tables of different things. They call them elements, meaning tables. But most of them are kind of focused around uh, fantasy. So they didn't really provide me much use during my uh, during my Edge of the Empire campaign. Which is still going, I just haven't got around to it lately. Uh, tavern, no, undead, visions and dreams. Really, there's no... Oh, there is 
just kind of a name thing. I'll come back to that. Um, hmm. Believe it or not, it does not look like there's a taverns descriptor chart in here, though. Domicile descriptors. <laughs> Civilization descriptors. City, no. Army action, I don't know, adventure don't know. Not, believe it or not, nothing in there for regarding. Uh, I'm gonna go, since there's a character appearance and it looks like it's got a lot of rather generic things, I'm gonna use that. 88. It doubles, but above our like, striking. <laughs> uh, striking in its cleanliness. Considering its location in the dock ward, I'm calling it. A, that's what I'm going to go with dock ward. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that probably uh, stems from playing water deep campaigns for over for a few years. So it's, but it's uh, nearly empty with only a handful of patrons. Um, when Eggle first arrives in it, the bartender. Uh, There's a bartender. Yes, there's always a bartender. We need a bartender. Uh, let's just roll character appearance again here. Our bartender. Fifty-two. Limbs. There's something about his limbs. He's. Um. He's missing his left forearm it's just a stump forearm uh, just a stump below the uh, the elbow we'll go with that uh, we need a name once again we will need a name uh, I don't know whether any of these NPCs will you know, make a difference I'm not going to do this for everybody uh, open this up Okay, one, let's do this again. 50-50 um, chance. Is the bartender male? Absolutely not. It is a sheep. So, uh, and just based on, I'm going to go human, female, uh, bartender. Um, the sp Spanish one comes up. Let's roll on the Spanish female names table in Xanathar's. Nine. She, Anna. Very simply, Anna. Uh, does she own the bar? Um, thinking, considering how quiet it is, I'm saying, gonna say that is very likely that she's the owner of the inn. Uh, let's find out. Very likely. 75 or under. 36. Yes. Uh, owner of the Lean Rose Inn. Okay, what do we got here? So, she's she's got a stumpy arm. <laughs> so, she's... Uh, what else do we know about this character? Um, what else could we could we know about this uh, this NPC right off the bat? Well, let's we'll go with that for now. As uh, the heavy you know oak door kind of uh, is pushed pushed pulled open, I guess pulled open, and uh, Eggle steps in kind of reaching back to, to close the door behind him All right so steps in and reaches back to close the door behind him and he pulls down a, the hood of, of his uh of his cloak and uh the bartender looks up she says, good evening stranger 
Alright, good evening. Can I offer you in a pint of ale? Possibly something to drink. Possibly something to drink. That is a pint of ale. Uh, possibly something to drink or something heartier. Something to eat. Oh, I've just pulled into port. Something to drink. Something to eat. We have mutton on the on the grill tonight. That would be fine. Feel free to have a seat anywhere. And somewhere back in the bar, one of the few patrons just lets out a long bleh, belch. And Eggle goes and finds himself a place to sit. In fact, he sidles up right up to the bar and sits down on a stool there. Kind of leans against the bar after dropping his sack and his backpack uh, beside him onto the floor. And he leans in. And at that time, the bartender slides a pint in front of him. That's the best ale we have. And, uh... Eggle looks at it. Picks up the... Picks up the mug. Like a... It's kind of like a wooden mug. <laughs> Gives it a sniff. And takes a long draw off the draft. It's, uh... It's just a little cool. But it kind of hits the spot. So puts it down. Oh. I needed that. I've been drinking rum for the last month. Oh yes, we do get a we do get a number of rum drinkers in here as well. So now I've been aboard a ship. So, uh, my name is Egil. I come from the northern reaches. This is, hmm. My name is Anna. I come from the Lone Rose Inn. This is my establishment. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, you said food. Mutton, yes, I would very lot, very much like like that. So it's, it'll just be a few minutes, and she goes off to do her do her thing. And Eggle sits there and he sips on his sips on his beer, and enjoying the uh, en enjoying the uh, the beverage. It's cool. It's you know it's. Not cold, old school beer wasn't necessarily kept cold, but uh, it hits the spot now. I'm just trying to see whether there's a, do we have a pricing for stuff like this in the expert book? Here's, I'm just kind of looking for. I think I've gone too far. Weapons and equipment. kind of fits so we'll just make things up uh, or we could do this let's do this uh, indeed pick me price list tavern let's see if there's anything out there a kind of discussion here. Uh, I think we've got a link of something here. Just want to get a sense as to what kind of costs because I'm not really sure. But 
taking a look here. Ale, four copper. Um, pork, we'll call it two silver. Now I'll come back here. Um, points of interest. So we do have a point of interest now. Um, do it this way. The loan grows in. Um, call it ale for copper and mutton to silver. Not a problem. Uh, so, yeah, so there we go. So, um, eventually the food comes out and Ed Edgel is famished. He kind of, you know, immediately kind of rips off some of the mutton and, you know, bites into, uh, bites into some of it, starts chewing it. And it's, it's okay. Like, it's, it's definitely, like, it's really considering how long he's been at sea now, it's the best mutton he's ever had and the best ale he's ever had. It's, it's great. He loves it. It is definitely worth the uh, the price that he's going to pay for it. But f he also uh, he's going to need to consider what he's going to do about uh, lodging for the evening as well. So we'll come back. We'll figure this out. Um, I kind of come back little bit here and we'll go mm -hmm. alright so there's a suggestion here two silver per night here we go After he's kind of devoured the mutton and he's feeling a little stuffed, and he's on his second, he's on his second ale. He's learned that uh, you know, he, he already learned her name is Anna. He said, "Anna, you have rooms here." And she says, "It's the Lone Rose Inn, uh, the Lone Rose Tavern." Yes, Egil, we have rooms, and we do have some available. Like I would very much like to sleep in a bed of my own, or you know. A bed of yours, I suppose. Oh, uh, that didn't quite come out right. She goes, I understand what you're saying, Eagle. It's two silver pieces for, for the night. We serve a breakfast in the morning. That would be... Perfect. Says, I will get a key for you. So, he orders a room. She goes, she gets a key for him. Uh, and... He kind of, like, it's been a long day, and he, you know, his arms are going to be a little sore from all that rowing, too. So Eggle is perfectly, he's happy to eat, to have a couple of pints of ale, and then go up to the room, lock the door, because he is a thief and doesn't trust anybody, including himself or other thieves, uh, and kind of go from there. So, um... Gonna do some quick math here. I'm gonna move the port syrup one over here. Uh, so we got eight copper for the ale. And room for the night. What are we at there? Four silver and eight copper. So he's going to be spending some money. So he's gonna to have to trade in uh so he hands her a gold piece. Uh, oops, where's my inventory? Here we go. He hands her a gold piece. And he, he says, just, just, just give me, just keep the change. Uh, he needs to kind of make his way. He's like, he's so happy to kind of be, be somewhere where he doesn't have to, uh, I would keep the change in a poor town might also come with some notice. Keep the change. It's like, uh, thank you. She slips the, uh, slips the coin into, uh, into, into a, a belt pouch, into a uh, purse on her hip. 
And now he takes the key and he says, I am going to turn in for the evening. And he throws his backpack over his shoulder, picks up the picks up the large sack, ugh, and trudges his way upstairs to the room to get some much needed rest. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, thinking that might actually bring an end to that to that scene. Uh, so scene number two, I think we're going. I think I'm actually gonna maybe. I want to end here. Scene number two. Um, yeah, you know what? I think I am gonna gonna end here. So I think that's probably good for this evening. Cool. Well, if you have been watching, I do appreciate. Oh, wait, sorry. Of course, it's the end of the scene. We need to deal with our adventure lists. Um, he's met. He's he. There are new characters here. We have Anna, owner of the Lone Rose Inn. Yeah, we do. We also have um, where's our session notes? We have Captain Mad Eye Hayes as someone who could return in some capacity. We also have well, perhaps I can do this. assume that one survives. Captain Christina. Um, oh, oh, definitely of the Prancing Unicorn. Do we have any other NPCs that we've created? That we've met here? Nope. Nobody that's going to matter. Do we have any threads that need to be changed here? Uh, he has not really explored Port Cyric. Um... We don't really have any threads connected to Anna. Uh, Captain Mad Eye could come in again later on. I can definitely see that as a possibility. Captain Castina, no issues. No, we don't really have any new threads, do we? Um, so yeah. I think that's going to kind of round out that scene. I think we're good. And we'll basically just kind of shift over here to the map for a second. We have not ventured off anywhere, so we're, we're in good shape. And I think uh, that is a very good place to end it for tonight. So, I don't know. Uh, this is interesting. I'd like next time to get a little more exploration, see if we can pick up the beginnings of an adventure. And I'm thinking like rats in a cellar kind of adventure you know maybe he meets up with the new player character that joins the party i don't know uh we'll see kind of how things go but if you are watching thank you very much for tuning in uh, i'm doing this mostly again just like my edge of the empire campaign this is mostly for me i just like to record it because it gives me something it, it kind of gives makes it feel a little more real if i'm talking to talking it out and talking to a camera and recording it so if you're watching thank you uh try to be not, not too cruel in the comments <laughs> take it easy